So welcome, everyone. Good to see you here. Uh, uh, I'm Markus Lehtonen from Intel, working as a cloud orchestration software engineer there, uh, mostly working on the uh, re resource management area in Kubernetes and, uh, and the runtimes. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Peter Hunt. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat, working primarily on Cryo, but sometimes Kubelet, Signote, Things, Podman, other container runtime related technologies. And today, we're going to be talking about class resources, Kubernetes' fastest way of shushing noisy neighbors. So I think we don't really need um, oh. a button. Uh, I don't think we really need to um, argue about this too much, but in Kubernetes, we don't really expect all workloads to be treated equally. Um, and there's been you know, the, a native construct in Kubernetes that's you know, represented this, which is the QoS quality of service. Um, QoS classes now represent, uh, specify CPU and memory limits and requests. Um, another mechanism that's been in Kubernetes since 119 that kind of does QoS, though it's not really called that, is uh, CPU uh, management, which allow you to pin certain containers to certain CPUs. And uh, that allows you to further customize the quality of service, even though they're not really called QoS classes there. But ultimately, there's going to be more resources on a node to guarantee the quality of service of. And uh, that's kind of the issue that we're looking at solving. So the overall mission is we're looking to improve the quality of service of applications um, to enable controls that don't fit into the current Kubernetes resource model. Uh, the three ones that we're originally targeting and that we're going to be talking about today are cache, memory bandwidth, and disk I.O. And the ultimate plan is to add a fundamental resource type to Kubernetes that allows us to express those as well as future resource types. So uh, properties of QoS class resource that we're going to uh, describe today um, that you know, we'll eventually be trying to add to Kubernetes is we have a uh, request class identifier instead of the amount of capacity. So currently, QoS class resources uh, specify the amount of CPU and memory that pod wants, um, but we want this, uh, this to be opaque to Kubernetes um, and be instead uh, specified in the container runtime. So you would specify in a container, you know, I want my QoS resource X to, uh, for this pod to be class A. Uh, in addition, the, uh, we expect there to be multiple containers that are able to go into the same class. In this case, we have container one, two, and three are all in class A. The container four uh, is, you know, we want some sort of different topology for that. So we're going to give it a separate class. And finally, we want a new and an enumerable set of classes. So you can have any number of classes representing the specified resource that you're trying to represent. So, you know, we, I mentioned earlier we were going to talk about a couple of examples. And so we're going to go through three different uh, resources that we're looking to uh, express with uh, QoS class resources to start. The first one is cache allocation. So in Linux, you can use the REST control FS uh, interface, uh, which is in SysFS, um, to uh, specify cache allocation. And this is already inherently class-based. There's a name for uh, you know, different caches that you'd allocate to different processes. Um, and I'd, ideally, you know, what we would get out of this is being able to hide some hardware details from the user. Um, the, you know, spe specific caches already um, represent, you know, are a good example of what we're trying to represent with the classes because there are, um, you know, M groups of class of, uh, you know, groups of caches, but we have N applications or pods or containers that would actually fit into um, those caches. Another example would be block IO. Um, so currently, uh, block IO is going to be pretty hardware dependent, even though it's specified through the C groups. Um, you have different nodes are going to have totally different hardware, and representing that in the cube API might be a little bit complex or challenging. So that is an appealing aspect of the opaque nature of these class resources, where only the container runtime has to be aware of the differing hardware levels. And since the container runtime, you know, this configuration of that could be um, node specific, you can have for different nodes, the different hardware could be accurately represented. Um, so block IO uh, specifies throttling uh, parameters uh, through device. So here's the runtime spec that would describe the block IO and to the left is the uh, what actually is written 
in the C group hierarchy. So I'm going to go through a, I'm going to walk through like an example of what we're kind of imagining uh, the value of this feature could be. So imagine a very realistic scenario in which we have our emergency alarm system that will go off if there's a natural disaster. We want you know that to be very fast and be reactive to um, situations so that we can get people safe quicker. And then we have a rock band website that uh, you know is going to handle the tour dates and all of the tickets for a popular rock band nearby. So as you know, if you weren't to try very hard to separate those two, you would end up looking. It would look like something like this, where you know both of them are sharing most of the resources. You know, the memory and CPU they're going to have, you know, differing amounts maybe, but they're going to end up on you know the same CPUs. And maybe if there's the Rock Band websites having something happen, um, the emergency alarm might get a little interrupted, and that's not very good. We want the emergency alarm to be able to be isolated. So, you know, now in Kubernetes we can represent this um, with a static CPU. Policy, so have them separated on CPU cores. That's a little bit better, um, and have you know the QoS classes be represented in the limits of requests for the pods. But that still doesn't really uh, give us all that we want. I mean, there's all these other resources that we've mentioned, plus others that you know need to be broken up. And still, uh, thrashing on the Rock Band website could cause interruptions with the emergency alarm. So, for example, something that we could do is uh, with your class resource feature, we could give the emergency alarm an exclusive cache uh, with RDT, and so that uh, would allow it to, you know, be a little bit more isolated from the Rock Band website. We could also throttle the memory bandwidth of the Rock Band website, so even if there's a tour that's just <laughs> been announced, you know, a spike in traffic won't cause the memory bandwidth to be taken up and be taken away from our emergency alarm system. We can also do, uh, we can give uh, the emergency alarm system block IO priority, um, you know, give it a higher weight so it's able to get the block IO resources it needs. And we do the opposite for the Rock Band website and throttle it so that, uh, you know, it's not able to use too many resources. So ultimately, what we get with you know, this kind of configuration is a situation in which our emergency alarm system you know, is finally able to get some peace in its multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster and able to get the resources that it needs so it can you know, help the people that need helping and not be interfered by those pesky rock bands. So I'm going to describe a little bit about what we currently have available for this uh, in Kubernetes. And actually, in Kubernetes, it's not really there. We have some support in the container runtimes, both Cryo and ContainerD have support for using REST control FS to control the cache and memory bandwidth, as well as the block IO um, using the block IO C group controller. But it's only in the runtime. So you basically use a pod annotation to specify the, um, the contri, oh cool. Oh no, it's that, I see. Um, you use a, uh, use a config file in the container runtime, and that corresponds to a config file that specifies that specific resource, and then you use an annotation to specify that resource uh, for the pod, and that in the container runtime interprets that and then does something with it. Uh, this is, you know, this works, this functions. We can get this kind of isolation, but we, you know, there's, it's not the best user experience. Um, for one, it's not at all related to Kubernetes. You can, uh, so there's no documentation. It's only really for early adopters, people who are intimately aware with the feature. It's also a, a pretty bad user experience. I mean, we're using an annotation to specify something that's going to be uh, specified like three or four levels down, depending of the stack, depending how you look at it. Um, so there's no visibility as to what resources are actually available on which nodes, no support in the scheduler to actually be able to delegate which you know, pod should be going to which nodes depending on the classes that they want. Um, you just have to know what, what there is um, and where to put it. Um, so it's not user friendly at all. And I'm gonna switch over to Marcus to uh, describe on the future that we would like to get to. So yes, uh, <clears throat> let's get get to the deeper uh, technical design of our uh, proposed enhancement in Kubernetes. And first I'm describing the, the kind of control flow that we've envisioned for the QoS class resources in, in the kind of complete solution in, in Kubernetes. 
So here we have a simplified view of a Kubernetes cluster uh, with an API server and a scheduler from the control plane, then one node depicted in, in, this, in this figure, and Kubelet and, and the container runtime running there and the system then uh, representing the uh, operating system and, it, and its services. So basically everything starts with the container runtime uh, initializing or discovering uh, the QoS class resources that are available in the system. So it might be something that the container runtime actually configures itself or it might be in some cases something that is pre-configured by the node or cluster admin and then the runtime only discovers what is, what is available on the system. Anyway, it gets the information of available uh, QoS class resources from the system. Uh, then it hands that information over to Kubelet, uh, which then in turn uh, updates the <coughs> node, node status object on the API server. So we get the information there in the node capacity that, okay, these three re resources, QoS class resources A, B, and C uh, are available, and then the specific classes of each, each uh, resource type. Then, uh, Pod, pod spec or pod, pod is created in the API server. It has some uh, specific requests uh, for the QS class resources. In this, in this case, uh, a pod would uh, request like class gold from resource A and, and class high priority from resource C. Scheduler picks that pod from the API server and does the normal. Uh, node filtering and fitting, trying to find a suitable node that could uh, uh, satisfy the uh, QoS class resource requests put, put there in the pod spec. Then it finds that, okay, our node X actually can satisfy the requests. So uh, class, uh, resource A class gold and, and this high priority for uh, resource type C are available on node X. It schedules, schedules the pod to the node, uh, Kubelet picks that up uh, and, and reads the, reads the uh, QoS class resource re uh, requests from the pod spec and hands that information over the CRI API uh, to, to the runtime. And then lastly, the runtime then uh, <coughs> is uh, enforcing the QoS class resource assignment of the containers on the container uh, processes on the system. So that's, that's how it's, we're envisioning it to work. Uh, one key idea in our proposal is to make the life of Kubernetes as easy as possible. Uh, so making the uh, QoS class resources as opaque to Kubernetes as possible. So basically the configuration and man management of QoS class resources uh, would be handled uh, by the container runtime. So Kubernetes doesn't need to know actually about anything about the implement, implement, implementation details of e each of these uh, QoS class resources. So it basically knows uh, what type of QoS class resources are available and what, what classes in each uh, type of resources are available on which nodes, but that's it. It doesn't need to understand any any, any more than that, like well, what, what specific resource type or, or class, class names actually mean. So it knows uh, resource types and names, but uh, class names, but not much more. And this would allow like easy implementation of, of uh, new types of QoS class resources without any, any, any changes in the, in the Kubernetes API or Kubernetes components. And one, uh, Use case we have in mind, for example, is uh, for, a, for a vendor to be able to implement uh, specific, specific uh, QoS class resources for their needs. For example, cloud service provider could uh, write, write a, uh, controls for, uh, let's say, um, disk or, or storage I.O. or network, net, network priority controls. All in all, we're trying to uh, come up with a 
generalized mechanism that would allow simple addition of, of new QoS controls into, into Kubernetes in the future, in a future proof way. So the scope of the CAP is uh, currently kind of twofold. First, first part is the CRI API between uh, Qwallet and the runtime. So we want the uh, Qwallet to be able to uh, communicate to runtime the QS class resource assignment, assignments from the, from the user and the other way around so that the runtime is able to tell the Kubelet what is actually available, available on the node. We also want to support in place updates of the QS class resource uh, assignments of, of running containers. And uh, currently, uh, we envision that the, we would have an initial user interface using pod annotations before, before the kind of uh, pod spec changes land, land in the Kubernetes mainline. So similar annotation-based uh, UI than what, what is currently available in the, in the runtime only approach. And the second, second uh, part is then the Kubernetes API. So we want to extend pod spec to have uh, specific fields for, for this QoS class resource requests. Uh, we want to update node status as well to, to see what is, what is available on the nodes. So this serves two purposes. First, visibility to users so they are able to see what is available on which nodes and then also it's an enabler for, enabler, enabler for cube scheduler to be able to do the right thing. So find a node that can uh, satisfy the requests for the pod. And the third part of the Kubernetes API we have in the cap at the moment is, uh, is having uh, permission control of, of available uh, QoS class resources by uh, extending the resource quota mechanism that is, uh, that is already available in Kubernetes. So uh, we think that it would be good to split the implementation in multiple phases. So first of all, the first, uh, everything under the runtime, between runtime and system is kind of uh, implementation details and out of, out of scope of the cap. But the fir first implementation phase would be just uh, just a CRI API between Kubelet and the runtime, and then also implement uh, interpretation of the specific special pod annotations in, in Kubelet as the kind of in initial user interface. And everything uh, in, in Kubernetes API and, uh, and the control plug components would be, would be then uh, implemented in, in, in future phases. And with the, with the KEP fully implemented, the user, inter, uh, user in, uh, interface would look and experience would be a lot better than what, what with the uh, runtime only approach that we currently have. So everything starts similarly from the kind of runtime configuration. In this case, an example of the cache, uh, cache management with, uh, with rest control. So similar thing, three classes there. But then, uh, with the runtime and Kubelet support, we, we, we are able to update the node, node status, see that, okay, this is available there, and that the pod, pod spec looks a lot, lot cleaner as well, and we can do like proper uh, input validation of the fields. And, uh, for example, so next we'll have a short demo of a proof of, ah, what? Sorry about that. Of a, uh, of a proof of concept Im implementation that we currently have. So uh, this demo will be kind of uh, demonstrating the full, full all com complete solution with the scheduler support, support uh, resource quota and everything. So this pre-recorded, I, I, I don't trust the corporate VPN and Wi-Fi and all, all, all that, so this almost almost uh, live, it was recorded yesterday, so 
So in, in this demo, we have a single sim simple single node cluster uh, with a, our proof of, proof of concept code based on fairly recent versions of Kubernetes and, and cryo container runtime. And I'll uh, quickly show the kind of uh, container runtime side configuration regarding uh, cache allocation and and and, uh, and block IO. So we, from the previous examples, already uh, familiar. So we configure uh, three three classes for uh, RDT gold, silver, and bronze, and then for block IO similarly three classes uh, high priority normal and low priority. And uh, first, I'll, I'll show the annotation-based UI, which is not, not much, but anyway. So in this, this case, we have uh, one, one pod with two containers, and we use these special annotations for setting, in this case, uh, for container one, like RDT class gold, uh, block bio class high priority, and then the second second container could be this rock band side, let's say, uh, with RDT, class bronze, and, and block guy of low priority. We create the pod, see that it's running, and then we can actually verify from the risk control uh, pseudo file system in, in under CCFS that actually some the, uh, PIDs of, of our containers were assigned to the uh, classes that we that we requested, so, so silver class will be empty because nothing was, was assigned there. We could do the same thing for block IO, but it's a bit, bit hassle to find out the correct uh, C group file system paths there, so we just trust that the block IO param parameters were uh, also applied correctly. So ne next, oh, then we delete the pod and see that, okay, nothing is anymore in the in the task file, so our container was was uh, deleted there. Uh, next, we'll see how it looks like in this complete solution. So now, looking at the node status, we can see that okay, we have these uh, these uh, type of uh, resource, curious class resources available on the node. So block IO classes, high priority, low priority, and normal as we configured, same for RDT, bronze, uh, gold, and silver. And we, in this demo, we have also one like stub, stub, uh, curious class resource doing really nothing, uh, nothing, just for demonstrating a thir third, third possible resource. So, uh, then we can take a look at the, how the pod spec would look like. So here, here we have like dedicated fields, uh, fields for the QS class, class resources. So similar example, or corresponding example with the example with the annotations, but now we use, just use uh, dedicated fields in the pod spec for that. Let's get that running and uh, see that it runs. And then again, we can take a quick look at the rest control file system. But okay, yeah, actually we got the got new PIDs in, in the in the task file. So the cache allocation was applied as, as we requested. So next one will be like uh, demonstrating the scheduler support. So here we have a pod spec with, uh, with a uh, non-existing RDT class bar and then also a resource that doesn't exist on the node called dummy3. And uh, we apply that and then if you take a look at the uh, uh, pod status, we can see that, okay, yeah, dummy three doesn't exist, and, and also RDT class bar is unavailable on any node, so this, this uh, pod cannot, cannot be run. If a node with, the, with this dummy, uh, dummy three resource and, and an RDT class bar would appear on the, on the cluster, then, then the pod would get, get scheduled, of course. And lastly, uh, we'll demonstrate the resource quota, how that looks like, or w would look like. So here we have a resource quota spec uh, extended with the class, QoS class resources. So for RDT, we only allow class bronze. For block IO, we allow 
uh, class is normal and low priority, and then for this dummy class, we uh, dummy one cures class source, we uh, allow the usage of classes B, C, and D. And we apply the quota and then take a look at the status of that quota object. And from there, we can, we can see that, uh, that the uh, limitage, limits that we put in place are actually now enforced. So for RDT only, only bronzes, bronzes allowed and lock IO normal and low priority as we, as we want it. So now if we try to create a pod with uh, this or analog curious class resources. So in this, in this case, we have like RDT class gold, which, which wasn't uh, wasn't allowed in the resource quota spec. We try to create that pod, and it it fails because uh, RDT class gold was not was not allowed. Then, if we modify the pod pod spec a bit. So change the RDT class from gold to bronze, then the, then the pod can be scheduled without, without any problems. So everything works fine. So that's, that was about the demo. Let's, go, ah, let's continue with the slides. Okay. Where, yeah. Hand it over to Peter. Thank you, Marcus. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're at and where we're going. So the current status of the KEP, um, when we originally submitted this talk, we had hoped that the KEP would have been made it in, but it's still under review. We're working through some details, specifically trying to figure out which parts of the phases uh, we're figuring out. So we're targeting 1.27 for this work. Uh, you can try it out now with just the container runtime annotation version now if you'd like. Some open concerns that we have are, you know, the usage of annotations in phase one, whether the qubit's going to become annotation aware and pass down the proper CRI object down to the container runtime, or if the qubit is, if we're going to go for full pod API support in phase one, um, so then the cube API server would pass down the resource to the qubit directly and then the qubit down to the CRI. And then some, you know, small API details here and there. Um, and then a piece of future or some pieces of future work past that future that we just talked about, uh, we can imagine a world in which maybe we'd want to make explicit the pod QoS class that you know currently exists where it's currently interpreted from the resources, uh, you know, the, the CPU and memory limits and requests. But uh, you know, maybe one day we'd want it to be explicit and actually say QoS class is burstable and um, give the container runtime that information. Also, uh, we want to, you know, possibly implement new types. So we've only talked about, you know, the three types that we have in scope now, but eventually you can imagine maybe we have some high bandwidth or like, you know, some swap or maybe some, there's some uh, hardware, special fancy hardware that has some special fancy um, resource that would want to be broken up between containers and pods like that. So we also have that in mind as well. If you are interested in getting involved through reviewing or testing or even contributing, uh, you can check out KEP 3008. Um, it's, uh, and you can help out over there. Um, other than that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and ask if there are any questions. Yeah, question. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious if there's any consideration about doing something out of the box that allows for basically fair sharing of these resources among pods running on the like a given node, like rather than configuring quality of service classes or something like that. Like, like would these quality of service classes, let's say that all the pods running on a node have the same quality of service class, is there something in place that would like throttle the pods um, or like, I guess I would just, could you elaborate on, on that a little bit more or like setting like limits and, and how that throttling would happen rather than just like prioritization? So I think no. it depends on the resource, right? 
like the like different resources handle having multiple processes within them differently. Um, so the focus of this is kind of designating priority, but theoretically, if there were multiple processes within, you know, uh, block IO uh, weight, for instance, then they would have equal block IO weight comparatively to each other. But then, you know, anything that has a higher one outside of that would be treated differently. I have a question. So one thing I wasn't sure is who is responsible for uh, managed allocation of the resource, including uh, recycling. For example, when, when the pod is uh, gone, now the resource needs to be uh, counted back. So traditionally, I think uh, the current situation is the Kubernetes is the one allocating the resource on the node. In your uh, cap, is that now the runtime's res responsibility? Yeah, basically the runtime runtime handles that. So yeah. So, so in that case, uh, how? So normally the runtime, for example, um, container D, it doesn't really have this view on the node, right? So, do you have actually now it had need to have persistent view for the the resource on the node? So I think I think like the I don't know. I feel like it's actually, it might be the admin who has the responsibility of balancing out the resources because they're the one that passes down the. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, because I, there's no automatic reconciliation th that the container runtime is able to do to like pull some other pod into a class when another pod within that class disappears. Um, so the balancing, I think, has to be done by the admin. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, what's the admin? Is like, the, uh, you know, the, the, the person writing the pod spec or like, you know, um, the person running the Kubernetes cluster would have to make sure that there are enough classes for the pods underneath them to be able to, you know, put into, uh, you know, be designated. But I think it's up to the pod author choosing the, um, the resource and making so, sure that they're balanced within it. Did, did, am I misinterpreting the question? I might be. I guess, uh, I'm a bit confused, like, for example, the scheduling, right? In, in that case, the scheduler need to be aware with how many uh, pods, for example, for quality QSA can fit into a node. So in that case, I, I guess the Kubernetes actually need to report the status relatively accurate. Yes. So yeah, how? Yeah, okay, now, now I've got the question. So, uh, so currently it's actually out of the out of scope of the cap to have this kind of accounting of these classes. So maybe that's that's a possible future uh, improvement, I guess, on this area. But it's it's left out of the scope of, of the cap currently to have any kind of accounting how many pods are actually uh, assigned to certain class uh, class, for example. Okay. So and yeah, and one reason is also to keep this kind of simple and not confuse people to because we are kind of talking about. Or trying to talk about uh, kind of unaccountable resources, kind of class identifiers. But yeah, that yeah, that's a good good question. Probably a future future improvement on this area. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I have a question related to the uh, using uh, Intel RDT to partition the cache and bandwidth. So uh, so after like pre partition the cache, is it possible like for even the CPU is idle, the process might use less resources so that um, it has some performance regression? Uh, so yeah, yeah, basically at the moment, uh, the risk control file system does, uh, does so that, yeah, if you, if you uh, limit the, limit the uh, cache available for, for some, uh, some class, so then even if the CPU is idle, it's only a, uh, uh, able to use the slice of cache that was actually allocated, so it's it's not okay. giving the kind of idle cache. Okay. Cache so so is there currently is there any solutions from Intel that can like burst the um, the usage from like say thirty percent to a hundred percent if the CPU is idle? Um, currently, is there any technology uh, to support that? So. Uh, from the point of view of this, this cap, so it's kind of implementation detail of that technology. So I'm, I'm, and I'm not kind of 
uh, entirely aware that what is what is happening in that space kind of on that like that technology so but, gotcha. but I mean yeah basically this uh, regarding the scope of this cap I mean it it doesn't so it's kind of technical implementation detail of that technology so thanks yeah but good question as well so I think there's a similar problem that we face today, like the order scaler may want to spin up a new node and it may not know what your requirements are. And if you spin up the wrong node that doesn't have the class you need, then you cannot schedule the part and then there's like a deadlock. So do you think if there's a common solution coming out that can say the part needs this and the node that's spin up should be of that particular type that'll have the classes that you need? Yeah, that's not stated in the cap at the moment. So I guess that's also part of part of the kind of future implementation phases to figure really out how the how the kind of uh, uh, autoscaler would would work correctly, and then also the upcoming uh, kind of in place pod vertical autoscaling is is something that it's not like stated here or in the cap currently. But it, it's also something that we want to want to be able to support. Thank you. All right, I think we're totally out of time, but um, yeah, thank you both. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.